each of us. Now, I love you, but I'm not taking time to count your hair. I love my wife more than I love you, and I don't even know how many hairs on her head. Do you follow what I'm saying? God loves us intently, and therefore, because of the value He places on us, we are not to have the kind of fear that has torment, because His perfect love casts out all fear. And friend, I want you to know Jesus emphasizes that to us because He wants us to act like God, not to act like us. Oftentimes, the judgmental heart that we have, we judge each other with a heart that, mm-hmm, you crossed me. Yeah, right, I'm going to get you. you. You did me wrong. I'll never forget it. And oftentimes, we take that attitude even towards ourselves. And we tend to even to judge ourselves more harshly than anyone else would. You know why? Because we don't trust God. If God is God, and He is, and He has determined to forgive us from every sin, then friend, who are you to hold your past against you? Who are you to remember those things and to hang them over your head and feel the guilt and the shame of those kinds of things when God has not only forgiven you of sin, but cleansed you from all unrighteousness? If God can forgive you, why can't you forgive yourself? Anybody ever made a stupid mistake or made a dumb decision? Oh, yeah, I could raise both hands and both legs if I could get them all in the air at the same time. The fact is, I don't have to live in shame or guilt. Why? Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. See, my trust and confidence is not in me hiding what I've done wrong. My confidence is in Christ who has unhidden what I've done wrong and yet forgiven it because I asked him to, and now I am free in the Lord Jesus Christ. How about y'all? You see, friends, God's not up for condemning you or me. He is up for relieving us and lifting us and encouraging us and acting towards us as a kind and gracious Heavenly Father, not as an org, as, as some kind of ugliness hanging over our lives ready to expose us in half a moment. God loves you. Don't fear, therefore. A little further, please, in verse number 8. Do not be afraid to confess Christ before men. Hope is genuine, my friend. Hope is very genuine. Don't be afraid to confess Christ before men. True relationship makes one bold to stand up for truth. Do you know sometimes I am actually wrong? And my wife is not in fear to say to me, Lan, did you think about it this way? What about this? What about? And oftentimes I have to grit my teeth and go, she's right. You ever been there, guys? Come on. Let's be truthful. I don't like to be wrong. But when I am, my wife is so bold as to speak to me in love. And when I see that, I say, thank you, hon, for being faithful to me in that manner. Tell you the truth, friends, if you're not correctable, you don't have a teachable spirit. Getting quiet in here. Woohoo! It is. True relationship makes one bold to stand up and speak the truth. Because we have proper relationship with God, God does not condemn but convicts us when we do wrong. There been times when I've spoke out of, out of turn in a harsh manner to my wife, and God says, eh, it's not the way I would have done it. And I have to go back and say, honey, I'm sorry, I spoke out of turn. I was angry, whatever else, I do apologize. Listen, friend, that doesn't demean me in her eyes. It raises me in her eyes because I'm mad enough to admit when I've been wrong. If you're the kind of guy that always has to be right, God help you. God help you. Because you'll never be all that God's called you to be if you can't admit where you've missed it. Well, let me get off my soapbox and go a little further. Also I say to you, Jesus says, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. 
Friend, every one of us one day will face God. We have a beginning, we have an end. The word of the Lord says the number of our days are in the hands of God. He knows our beginning from our end. I have, a, I have an expiration date. I don't know when that is. I hope it's not real soon. But my expiration date will come as yours will. And when that occurs, I will face the Creator Himself as you will. And every person in this world, whether they believe in God or not, they will. And when they face Him face to face, He's the one who gave breath. He is the one who gave life. And we will have to answer before God, what did we do with his answer to all of our problems? Jesus Christ, his only begotten son in this world. And that day, we will give answer whether we received or did not receive his grace. Jesus will be the one who will stand up at that moment and say, Father, this is your son. This is your daughter. And they're welcome in the family. And the father will look at us and say, welcome, come on in because of the blood of of Jesus Christ. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, for the grace of God, Jesus coming and living sinlessly and dying for us and raising again from the dead, for all of that, He will say to those who have received Him as Lord and Savior, He says, welcome, enter in. But friends, there will be fo folk who will speak against Christ even though he's done everything for each one of us, there are those who will speak against Christ. Friends, it says when you, when you, even if you curse Christ, you'll be forgiven. You'll be forgiven. But here's one thing that God says. Jesus speaks to us. He teaches us. He says, um, it'll be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. There is a line somewhere that a person could choose to cross in which they, and the old term is to blaspheme, speak against, to put down, to come against Holy Spirit. And that sin will not be forgiven. Why? Because it's Holy Spirit who draws us. It's Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sin. It's Holy Spirit who convinces us that Jesus is the only answer. It is Holy Spirit who draws us to the Father through Christ. And if He stops drawing because you have signed out and signed off, then friends, there's no draw. There's no care. There's no concern for the things of God. Has anyone committed that sin? Don't know. God's a judge. I'm not. People who have thought they've crossed the line, there's still something in many of their hearts that they want God, but they think they've crossed the line. Listen, if even if you desire to know about God, it means you haven't crossed the line yet. And I just urge everyone, today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next week. Today. Make your decision today. Verse 11 says, Now when they bring you into the synagogues, and magistrates and authorities before them. Do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. You see, not only does the Holy Spirit draw us, convict us, convince us, and bring us into the family of God, but He also abides with us as the Spirit of truth. Now, my phone, I can take out, I can hit this little button, it'll tell me exactly where I am on Google Map. Have you ever done that? It's very interesting. And, and, and it also, if you punch another little area, will tell you which is north. I still don't know which is north. Is it? It's that way. Thank you. Very good. Um, but that little thing on my iPhone, on my phone rather, will tell me direction. It locates me. And yet God, before that thing was invented, has Holy Spirit in us to locate us where we need to be. He gives us information, ideas, concepts. He teaches us the spirit of truth, reveals to us what needs to be known. And friend, there's no greater advantage than to having the advantage of God's heart in you, his spirit in you, leading and guiding day by day. No it's a great advantage in your heart and spirit. Friends, in verse 13, the rich fool parable. This, this is an important part because Jesus knew there would be people who, though hope focuses on God and focus on people, 
There are people, there are folk who simply focus on themselves. I can do it. I am my own man. I am my own woman. I'm my own person. I can do it my way. Who cares about God? I don't care about Him. I don't even believe in Him. And therefore, I'm going to make my own way. Well, Jesus speaks of that in the next few verses. Then one of the crowds said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Here's a man calling out for justice, and in reality he's calling out of the covetousness or the desire in his heart to control even in his family. The law says the eldest child received a double portion. Why? Because they were supposed to take care of their parents. The other remaining children in that family would receive an equal portion among themselves, but the eldest received the double portion. That's what the law said. That's the way it was. That's the way it happened. And when this fellow cries out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. He was saying, I want you to be the arbitrator. I want you to be come in. And in the middle, middle of this confusion that I'm causing, this contention which I'm bringing up in my family, for which there already is a direction, he said, I want you to tell us what you would do. What's your opinion? But Jesus said to him, verse 14, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness. See, covetousness is such an ugly sin because it cancels out promises. It cancels out covenant. It cancels out that which God has set in order. You say, well, how can that be? Well, let me tell you. Adam and Eve, perfect in the garden, no problems, one law. Not 12 commandments, or 10 commandments, rather, 12 commandments. Where did that come from? Oh, i got to go back to Bible school. Ten Commandments, or the 600 and some odd laws that came out of them that, that people of, of God invented out of those. And all the laws that we have today, and by the way, anybody read the health care bill, 20 some odd, 2,000 whatever it is, pages this big, probably weighs more than the smallest person in this room. Who has time to do that? All of these laws, and so, in the garden they had one law, and they broke that. <laughs> Don't eat of the tree. They broke that. Let me tell you, friend, God, God says to us that He loves us, He loves us, He loves us, and is willing to forgive us. Watch this. And He said, uh, Beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Friends, some people can never be satisfied with what they had. They, they, they just want more and more. I heard about a guy the other day, uh, they offered him, what was it, $94 million for a handful of years playing on a particular team. He took it as a slap in the face, and I'm thinking to myself, $94 million for three, four, five years' work? My goodness, that's good money if you can get it. And he took it as a slap in the face. I'm thinking, what does he want? What does he want? But yet there are people who are never satisfied with what they have. They always want more. Why? Because they need it? No. Because they want to exert pressure, control because of it. But he spoke a parable to them to illustrate this. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself. See, what you think in here will soon come out of your mouth. You, you think your thoughts are hidden? You think your attitudes and opinions are hidden? One day, when you least expect it, you'll open your mouth, and out of your mouth will come really what you believe in your heart. You can smile and look nice and everything else, but what's really in there will come out of your mouth. It will betray you. Because that's what you truly believe in your heart. So this man thought within himself saying, what shall I do? That's why we as Christians want to sanctify even what's in our heart. Because out of it comes the issues of life. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. What shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops, so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, See, people talk to, them, to ourselves, don't we? We say, yeah, no, we don't. Yeah, we do. We say within our hearts, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God has something to say to that kind of a person, to all of us. Soul, he says to him, fool. A fool is a person who has not considered everything, not considered the possibilities. A fool is a person who decides to do it their way and not God's way. A fool is a person who's withdrawn himself from any kind of input and he thinks he's the ruler of his life. That is a fool. Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. 
then whose things will be which you have provided? Every one of us came in this wor world naked as a jaybird. And we're going to go out naked as a jaybird. And nothing you have gained in this life can you take with you. We may bury you, bury you with your rings and your jewelry on, but it stays here on earth. It doesn't go with you. It may bring you beautiful flowers and everything else. None of that goes with you. None of your holdings, none of any of that go with you. You enter in the presence of God just as you came in this world. Naked as a jaybird before him. Listen. So he is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Friends, should your comfort and peace depend upon your possessions or should it depend upon your relationship with God? I, I cannot be any more um, um, or emphasize this any more with your hearts and lives this morning. God loves you just as you are. Your problems in life, your sins, your shortcomings, whatever it was, God wants to forgive and set you free. He wants you to trust in Him completely. Why? Because He's the only guarantee out of this life into eternity of safety. And friend, God, it's not a religion. It's a relationship. If I had a religious attitude towards my wife, we'd say, good morning, dear. Go brush your teeth before you even get close to me. You know, and, and we would just kind of live this kind of a life that is it just, it wouldn't be good. But relationship, I can get up with my mouth before I brush my teeth and say, darling, I love you. She'll say, darling, I love you. And you know what? We don't care. Why? Because relationship binds us together. I, I, I'm trying to make this in a way, friends, that you can understand. God is about meeting your needs. He is about preparing you and me in this life to bring us into that eternity which each of us will enter. You can go with him. You can go without him. But the choice is yours. Do you love him? Do you know him? Whom to know is life eternal. Have you met him? Do you understand his love and his grace for you? I don't know every heart in the room this morning, but God does. And he knows where you are with him. Let him by his grace speak to your hearts. And I'm just going to ask you, cross the room. Maybe you're here today and you've not made that decision for Christ. You've not made that decision to just give your life to him. And maybe at this moment, Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and said, now's the time. You don't understand everything? I know that. But neither did I when I received the Lord as my Savior as a little kid. But friend, he's willing to work with you. He's willing to bring you through step by step, moment by moment, answer your questions, and draw you near to him. And I, I just ask openly this morning, if, if that would be you, just to let me know by uplifting of your hand that it's time for you to make a decision for Christ, to receive him in your life. Would you do that? Anyone in the house, I just give you that opportunity. Just give you that opportunity. All right? I'm not going to belabor the point. Would you stand with me, please? You see, Pastor, I'm, I, I've been to real churches before. And they beg and plead until everybody's crying everywhere. And every... Hey, if the Holy Spirit hasn't convinced you to this point, then I can't. So I'm not going to belabor it. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I pray across the congregation today that you will give a spirit of revelation knowledge of who you are and who we are to be in you. Lord, if there be those here who've heard the message this morning, I pray that you may interrupt their dreams or interrupt their sleep or interrupt their thoughtful moments. Bear witness to their hearts by the power of Holy Spirit's presence of the reality, O oh God, of the destitution of their hearts and lives and, Lord, their need for you. 
and your absolute love and ability to forgive and desire to make them part of the body of Christ. I ask for your grace. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Sing this song before the pastoral blessing. Hallelujah. 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 Church, for the blessing this morning, there'll be prayer workers here at the altar. If you need to come and pray or need someone to pray with you, they'll be here at the altars ready to receive you and assist you in that. Church, may the Lord bless you, may keep you, may His face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. May Holy Spirit flow through you powerfully and mightily and bring you to a divine appointment of grace wherein you may speak of his love and mercy to someone else in need. And may Holy Spirit bear witness through you and by that which you place in the heart of another person, his absolute love and care for people in this world. Go in the grace of God, in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.